Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Trust we have had a great day so far. Welcome to tonight's edition of HR Learning Mentorship Series. And we'll be looking at a very important and timely topic, financial literacy tips for HR professionals. We will always need this, this topic, but the times we are now even require us to pay extra attention so that we can survive we can pull through and we can make the best out of the situation. Our facilitator tonight is not a stranger to this prestigious platform. She is Faith Akintunde, and she is an, a veteran in the HR space, an icon in the HR industry. She is the Human Resource Director Nigeria and Middle East and Africa with Kimberly Clark. And tonight she will be sharing with us from a wealth of experience, knowledge, and wisdom on financial literacy tips for HR professionals. Thank you so much, Madam, for creating time out of your tight schedule. You have the floor, Madam. Thank you very much, um, Yemi, um, for this platform, and of course, for an opportunity to come again. It's always exciting um, coming over here to, to share um, today. We're going to be talking about financial literacy for HR professionals. And so we know the community we are in is the community for um, HR mentorship. So, but in case you're here and you're not an HR professional, the tips would also be useful for you. So um, no stress, don't, don't, don't stress about it. But again, um, as an HR professional, we believe that this um, tips would really be helpful for you and then for your workforce. So I believe that um, at the end of the day, you'll be able to share some of these videos with your um, organization or your team members and all. Okay, so quick caveat before we continue. I'm not um, a certified financial expert. expert. Um, I have my background in investment banking. I have, I mean, I started economics, I have masters in economics, and the tips I'm going to share today are based on, um, like Yemi said, knowledge, um, experience, right, but not based on certification or proven research tested methods. So they are tips, and I hope that you will find them useful and leverage them for your personal finance. Okay, that being said, um, we'll just go quickly into it. Setting the background is the fact that we all, yes, need financial literacy, whether you are HR professional or otherwise. But because of the kind of work we do as HR professionals, it is then important that we are steps ahead. As HR professionals, we've got to have business acumen, that's one. Also, financial literacy is another um, required skill, or as, well, I wouldn't say expert, it's skill that we should have so that we can be equipped as individuals. And of course, we can also provide opportunities to support our employees where it concerns um, financial well-being. Okay. So I want to set a background, a quick, like a bedrock, right? like a foundation for us. There are key concepts that we should consider um, when talking about financial freedom. I'm sorry, when talking about financial literacy. Right. The aim of today's conversation, the why I believe why you are here, either you're watching this video or you're live on this call, is the fact that you want to be financially free. Now, to achieve financial freedom, there are a lot of foundations, a lot of um, basic things that you should set in place. Right. But I personally think that these two are very critical when it comes to attaining financial freedom. And that is having financial goals and financial discipline. As individuals, we all wish to be financially free. And remember, when you were young, uh, they asked you what you want to be. You already have that clear picture of being a rich kid or a rich person, being free. You want to spend anything you want. Um, you you want to spend any amount you want to spend. You want to be able to achieve. I mean, I, I mean, um, afford anything. Right. We have all those dreams. Now you are mid 
into your life. Maybe you are a quarter into your oh, Laris, I just assume you're going to spend 120 years. You're 30, you're 20, you're 40. And it's it's not looking like it, right? There are wishes. We all have wishes. We have desires. But having clarity of goals, having the discipline, most importantly, to take step by step, um, move or make moves right towards your freedom is what a lot of us lack and that's what's making a difference between um the have and the have not now let's not go into those details i know there are a lot of nuances and biases around that topic there is your background there is your foundation there is the family you know and all of that but let's leave all of that aside and come into a clear playing ground. We all have um, an opportunity to become whatever we want to become using the opportunities, using the resources that life throws at us. That is, that, that, that's, that, there's no cheating in that one, okay? So that being said, it is then the discipline that we apply in our finances, given whatever comes our way. Of course, there's a lock, there's a favor of God and all of that. But if you take those ones aside, let's not take it aside. God's favor is very important. So if you think you're not in that space of having God's favor, you should find yourself in that space. So we will not underplay that. But it's key that the role you have to play is to have discipline when you have set a goal. So don't just stop at wishing to have financial freedom, but you've got to do what it takes. So setting financial goals and being disciplined to attain what is, what is required, the actions required are very key to attaining financial freedom. And I say all of this because I'll just give you one example. I had, okay, so my light, just one. Oh, wow, 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 wow. One minute, please. Um, my light just went off and I need to just bring an alternative quickly. I hope that is fine. One minute, please. Okay. Yeah, we're back. Apologies. I mean, it's what it is. It's where we are. Okay. All right. So I was saying that there is there was a story that um so I'm just gonna share fresh, okay. I hope you can see the clean screen. Okay. So there is there's a story of um, a driver that I, I had working on my team, of course, was an HR admin manager some time ago. I had drivers in my, I mean, pool drivers and all of that working with me. And one day, so before that one day, every Friday, these people would come to me and, oh, uh, Friday, thank God it's Friday, we would give them something and all. One of those days, I must have shared a story on more than one platforms, and probably you watch my videos, you would have seen or listened to this story. One Friday, this man came and said, Madam, today, <laughs> what I need is not the regular money that you usually give us to buy something. I was like, what's up? Hope all is well. And he was like, oh, that is trying to roof his house. This was a driver. And I'm talking about a story of almost 12 years ago. It was a rude shock to me, like, okay, this guy was earning, I think, 40 or 45K then. And he's coming to ask me, HR manager, <laughs> for some funds to roof his house. 
And of course, I was a bloody tenant, you know. Bottom line is, like we said, every everyone has a um, relatively a clear playing ground. We, let's just assume that we can start afresh together. We have opportunities that life throws at us, but that discipline would help us. Now, the next background to set is key questions you want to ask. I know you have your reasons for being here today. You want to be financially free. You want to be financially smart and intelligent. Very good. But what does your rich life look like? And I borrowed this from one of the guys I, I follow um, on financial literacy. He's always saying, what does your rich life look like? And I'd just like to borrow that from Ramith, Ramith Seti and say that, what does your rich life look like? Do you have a picture of what you really want out of life? Or oh, I want to be able to afford anything. Fantastic. But really, what does it look like? There are tools that you could use to actually make a clear plan around what do you want? For some people, it is just being able to wake up without having to hit the third Milan bridge, for example, at 5 a.m., deciding how you want to spend your morning, how you want to spend the rest of your time during the day, spending time with your children. You know, what exactly does your rich life look like? That's an important part of this financial freedom journey. Having clarity of what you want out of life and in terms of how rich you want to be or what does riches look like to you, it would help you not to be part of that rat race while everybody wants to be richer than the other. That's very important. Now, how do you scale your income and cash flow to achieve the kind of rich life that you really want? Every one of us either you are working or you're running a business should have a means of income. That's important. You can't be here and we're talking about financial literacy and you don't have anything that is bringing cash to you or that's bringing money to you. That's, that's clear. Now we know where we are. We know the market we operate in, unemployment rate is so high and all of that. A lot of us are looking for jobs or looking for better jobs. That is fine. But does a day pass without you earning money? Does a week pass without you earning money? Does a month pass without you earning money? If those, if all of that, if you're answering um, yes to all those questions I've just asked, then we're not, we've not even started. So it's important that there is a means of income that is coming. It doesn't matter the size. So it's not about the size. It is about something coming in, right? And it doesn't have to be uh, structured paid employment when we talk about income. Now, when you then have that, the next question is how do you then scale that income for a continuous cash flow, okay? I haven't set that platform. I haven't set those foundation. Then let's talk about the second question I just asked. How do you scale your income for cash flow? The starting point is to earn. You have to earn. Yeah, today, I mean, you, you heard my profile, what I do and where I work and all of that. Uh, we didn't start like that. I, I've, I would always proudly say that I started as a bloody contra uh, contract employee. I was a contract staff for not less than a, a year and a half thereabouts, or let's just say about a year plus. But the bottom line is earn. Right. Something has to come in. And before I started as a bloody contract staff, while I was schooling, I had sold different things. I sold granules in school. And I'm proud to say that <laughs> I sold granules. I did multi-level marketing. I sold stuff. Right. Not unprofessional stuff, but I sold things. Okay. <laughs> earn. Earn. I had a privilege while in school. I got a, a, a scholarship then. That scholarship. Don't tell my parents. I didn't spend it on school fees. <laughs> that was the first bulk money I had. And I thought about buying a land from it. Of course, how much was it then? How many years back? I think more than 20 years, thereabouts. What am I was saying? A long time ago, decades ago, right? But I was really thinking about buying land then. I, that was the money I actually used to start trading in stocks. 
I picked interesting stocks from while I was in school. That is then not about, I mean, that's then about not spending all you earn, right? Do not spend all you earn, save. Now, what you should do first before you spend is save. You have, you have heard that and I'm saying it again. Do not spend and save what is left. Save and then spend what is left. Why? Because the money you are earning can never, it's not a cost, can never be enough to cover your expenses. Now, let's even say so much, right? People will help you to spend the money. So it's important that you are conscious that you take out savings first before you start to spend. Now, when you save, saving is nominal, right? It really doesn't add any value, especially when you are then in a space where, um, um, in a space where inflation rate is so high, right? It's important that you are then investing what you save. That's important. You are investing what you save. Invest what you save. Don't save it in a bank or keep it somewhere that inflation will erode what you have saved. That's an important conversation to have. Now, a question around what you invest in is a different ball game. I'm not here to share with you investment vehicles and all of that, but it's important that I'll just highlight it here. Do not invest in what you don't understand. If you do not understand it, seek help to understand it before you put money in it. When you're putting your money in it, ensure the fundamentals are right. Fundamentals, any investment asset or investment instrument that does not have an underlining asset, be careful before you invest in them. So examples of things you can invest in, of course, land. Land, I, I mean, I can't, I can't say too much about land. Land is an investment that would help you, um, that would, over time, of course, it would um, appreciate such that it can catch up with inflation rates. There was an asset that a friend of mine was talking about, you know, I mean, I wouldn't say right, I think a colleague was talking about buying an asset and, how many years back, uh, they were selling that property for, I think about 30, 35 million. That's about three, three years ago. Today, that asset is about 60, 65 million. So, I mean, the conversation about inflation is there, but it's a different conversation when it comes to real estate. But then be careful that you're, you're making the right decisions um, when it comes to investing in real estate. Of course, there is risk, but the risk is not as high um, compared to some other investment asset. Now, when you invest, don't stop at investing. Reinvest. So some of us, um, a lot of us would maybe prefer um, giving your money to the bank or putting your money in a fund and all of that, and then you get a return or you put it in a fixed asset, you get a return. What do you do with your return? Reinvest it rather than spend it. And say, oh, I've, I've saved, I've invested, and I've returned, and then, oh, I want to live large. It's not yet time, right? Reinvest it. So the more you reinvest, and then you, you begin to have something called compounding, right? It begins to compound a geometric progression. Those are very important ways that you could scale your income and cash flow. Okay, there are a lot of other ways, but of course, we're looking at maximizing time. I'm sure we might still have a conversation related to this thereafter around um, where to invest and um, what to invest in. Okay. On to the next, All right? Starting small is better than not starting at all. Starting small is better than not starting at all. Some of us, when you look at your financial goal or your ambition, 
you are worried that I, I can't even, how much am I earning today? Oh, um, I'm earning 50K. I beg, let the poor breathe, make a chop. Yes, but you can still save 2,000, 5,000 from your, from your earning. What I would suggest is look at a percentage. There is a guiding principle that we use in my house and we say that whatever income enters into our hands, after you have taken your tithe, your 10%, you're paying yourself, not less than 20% should go into savings. It's a tough place to be, but over time, you would get used to that strict um, what's it called that you have put into your, your, your strict structure that you have put in place. Now, it's important that you don't get fixated on just your salary. Well, the moment you have set that principle of what you would save, right, you will realize what is left is not enough. And that will push you to begin to think of where else or what else can you do to earn more. The goal should be earning more so that you can save more. Our salaries are hardly enough, never enough. If Dangote is looking for money, he's still looking for money right now. Dangote, the richest man in Africa, I believe, right? Is he looking for money? Who am I not to look for money? <laughs> Do you understand? So we have to start looking at how can we improve our cash flow? How can we improve our sources of income? But ensuring that we do not think of delaying a day further because we do not have everything we need. So you can start small, start small. Now, when you start small, you are thinking about the things that you need to do to start small. Now to start small, you need to first clear, be clear about a couple of things. Education is key when it comes to finance, financing or finances or financial literacy and freedom. You need to educate yourself. There's a lot you need to know, um, especially if you, you didn't study any finance related um, course in school. Every person needs to be financially educated. Um, recently, I, picked, I brought my kids together and I, I showed them one Excel that I was working on. I programmed it and I was coaching them. Interestingly, I mean, my kids are quite young, but I showed them and I was asking them questions that how much do you want to be able to have and at what age? So, I mean, it was a, an opportunity to dream. So one of them said, oh, I want to be a millionaire at so and so, so, so age. And I plugged that figure into the Excel that I built and I was showing them, if you want to be a millionaire at 20, how old are you now? We'll plug the age into it. We'll plug how much you're, you want to make, you want to become a millionaire. So at, at a minimum of 1 million naira, we're in Nigeria, right? Um, if you're in any part of the world, depending on the currency, you put it in there, put the age, it will bring it, I mean, it brought it out, how much you need to save daily, monthly, quarterly to achieve that target at the um, dates that you have set there. You know what I did to my kids? They made, it made them to start thinking of, oh, I am a student, what can I do? My kids, within a month, I asked them to build, uh, I mean, bring up an idea, what can you do to earn money? Now they started small businesses. Of course, the stretch is on me. I'm supporting and coaching and all that. But that's, those foundations are very important. They then begin to ask questions. How do you, why do I build a business case? How do I know my market? How do I, you know, questions, the right questions. Those questions will help you to seek knowledge and you begin to get more and more educated. When you see platforms like this, you can attend, read books, watch videos, and lots and lots of resources online that could help you. You need to first have that interest and, of course, continue to then educate yourself financially. Now, be careful around feeling that you now know everything when you've gotten educated and then you go all out practicing what you learn. It's better to practice what you learn, but seek knowledge, get help. I have a couple of my friends that are in the investment space. I mean, I left them in that space. That's where I started from. But a couple of times, I get to ask them questions. Just tinkering. I may not have money to, to play around and all of that, but just 
enlarging my mind. When the money comes, that is not when you begin to think of where to put the money in. Today, if you ask me, if I get a hundred million dollars, what would I use it for? I can tell you, I can answer you because I'm, I'm ready, I'm prepared. Not because I've laid my hands on a hundred million dollars before, but my brain has handled it. My brain can handle it. I have all the scenarios. I have all the numbers, the, the things that it could be, I mean, put into. And that is how we enlarge our minds, getting ready for when the opportunity comes. Now set a goal. We're talking about setting financial goals. You need to define what you want to achieve. Whether it's a savings or retirement, say, I mean, a fund, or you want to buy a home, you want to pay off your debts. I mean, there are a lot of conversations around that space. There's just so much to talk about when it comes to this financial um, literacy topic or even financial freedom. You want to pay off your debt. How do you want to pay it off? A couple of things in that space, right? Then you need to have a clear objective. Yes, you have a goal, but break it down. How do I want to achieve this? Just like I showed you the Excel that I did for my kids. They want to achieve one million naira at this age. This and this and this are what they need to do daily, monthly and all of that. And then they break it down into, oh, I need to have a business that is earning me at least 500 naira every day. You know, so every day that that amount is not achieved, it means we have to double up. You know, you should have something like that that sort of guides you on your dream, on your goal. And then you're able to take it one step after the other. Remember, we said starting small is better than not starting at all. So you need that clarity to know what to do part time. OK. Automate. You know, we spoke about savings, right? You need to automate your savings goal. Payday. You know that there are friends, there are family members. Everybody knows your payday. If you didn't tell them the day it hit your account, but people know from the day from 20th thereabouts, people are already sending you messages, greeting you. They are not greeting you only because they love you. Yes, they do, but they know something is about to drop so that they will be your good books. Everybody wants to be ready to take on what is entering into your hands. And it's not a problem when you share, but I tell you, if your savings is not automated, you will not save. You will not save. There are times that my account is blank and I just see a notification, your, this, um, um, what's it called, um, plan or whatever, 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 not successful, you know, because there was no balance in the account. But anything that that um, process meets in my account, it will sweep it up. Now, I can't go and collect it because it's automated, it is locked. So, for example, when kids are going to resume school, rather than chasing shadows or running up and down, asking people for help, you would have planned it ahead and you would be able to have something aside to pay school fees. So, for different um, fund requirements for different needs that may arise in the future. You should have some form of automated savings. And then for your investment, you should have some automated savings. And you have to program it in such a way that you don't program it to collect it in December. December is debt. You want to do debt in December? <laughs> you, would not, you would not remember that... Uh, there is a plan you have or a goal. In December, a lot of us are not thinking straight again. You want to just enjoy yourself. You've been stressed during the year. So you, you, those kind of savings should not um, mature in some critical periods that you know that you might not be able to make sound financial decisions. So those things are very key. Now, you should have an investment plan, planning when you want to invest, what you want to invest in and where you want to invest in, right? Um, and yes, this is very important. You need to understand your risk appetite. How much loss can you accommodate? How much loss? It's very key because, we, there, I mean, there have been stories of people that died because of a financial loss. Why? They, their mind couldn't take it. So if you are one that couldn't, that can't take high risk, be careful the kind of 
investment assets that you put your fund in. Your risk appetite, you've got to be aware of it so you know where to put your money in. Deal with get rich quick mindset. Hmm. MMM. Um, all kinds, I don't know. All the Ponzi schemes you can mention, there are lots and lots of them. There are lots and lots of them. You've got to be careful that you deal with the fundamentals. See, the fact is, people put their money in get rich quick stuff, not because um, they're not smart. There are fundamentals in the mindset or their fundamental mindset that make us make those decisions. You want to have good money without laboring. It's fine. Uh, you, you can labor a little and get so much. Labor like a rat and make money like a, a, an elephant. Fantastic. But the fundamentals have got to be right. Any investment that does not give you a right on the lining asset, be careful about it. Any investment that tells you, oh, bring so, 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 so within one week or you within a day, you will get something. We'll be paying you this daily. Do the analysis. What business are they likely to be investing in that can end them whatever they are promising you? They will make a profit on it and they still give you back that much. It doesn't make sense. So deal with it that see anything that would that doesn't make sense. If it is too good to be true, it is most likely not true. So be careful of get, get rich quick syndrome. If you put your money in it, you will lose a lot. It's better you save that little you have and grow it gradually than assume that overnight. And it's the same thing with uh, betting. I know some of us work in gaming companies and all of that. Fantastic. I don't have a problem with people that I do, I mean, I play games and all. But I'm saying there is, a, I mean, I'm an economist, so uh, forgive me if that doesn't sound great to you. You might have won any of those gaming um, store for and the windfall. Uh, it's one or two in a thousand. It's not everybody that would win something based on what you're putting. And think about it. Sometimes when they get those windfalls, if the fundamentals are not right, and which most times they are not right, give them a year or two. They are back to um, zero points. Right. Another tip is to have a conscious spending plan. Don't just spend based on what's in your hand. Some of us, when we have a little, everybody knows. Why? Because it is how we have the money in the post that we spend. But you need to have something called conscious spending plan. I learned that also from this virtual financial coach who talks about money a lot. And his name is Ramit. You can check some of his videos as well. Have a conscious spending plan. You need to have a plan that shows how you want to spend what is coming into your hands. Have a budget. When you have exhausted what you have planned on your budget, as long as nobody is going to die, whatever other thing is coming in at that period, you can plan it for the next month or for the next cash flow after you have made your savings. So it's important you have that plan and be guided by it. Okay? More tips for you to, I mean, attain progress. Research on pricing. When you want to buy things, right, especially major, maybe um, home asset or major things, right, it's important that you research. Sometimes you have bought it and then you realize, oh, I don't know, you go to, some of us go to the markets, you have bought something here and then you just want to price it around to know whether they cheated you or not. <laughs> that's, that's a futile effort. You bought it already. Why not research the prices before you buy? Research. When you research, you can know what the markets, um, the, the prevailing price is or where you can get it cheaper. A lot of those information are available online. You can ask people that deal with that. And when you then research, that can give you an idea of where you can get bulk, right? Where you can get it cheaper. I know you've listened to a lot of um, sessions around this time and people would have spoken to you about buying bulk. Uh, pulling funds. I've done a couple of videos on that as well on YouTube. You can see them. But this time around, let's talk about researching price. Get more information on how to get it cheaper. Okay? And do not be afraid to negotiate. You need to push, push. Recently, I, I made a decision and when, I, when they gave me the, um, 
the I was to take a leverage, right? I, I should I was take a loan, and I realized that I could actually ask for a lesser interest. I I I've never negotiated with a bank before. But the times are requiring it. <laughs> so I pushed back. So they sent the, the contract. I looked at it. I said, hey, no, I'm not going to pay this. And I had to begin to look at what and what am I putting on the table for the bank for them to give me a cheaper rate. Right. So you, when you're negotiating, of course, you, must, you need to get your facts right. You need to get the right information and push, push back. It's not everything they tell you, uh, it's embarrassing. They will think I don't have money. Oga, yes, let them think you don't have money. Negotiate. But of course, we're not saying going to the supermarkets and start negotiating. <laughs> they will think something is wrong with you. But you can actually look for cheaper options. There are um, items we buy and we pay a premium because we are buying branded items. You could buy the same item. It will give you the same value if it is not brand, if it's not branded. So think about that as well, right? Renegotiate cheaper loans. I've spoken about that for cheaper rates. Re renegotiate your loans. Now, another part there is existing loans. You can renegotiate or sell that loan to another bank at a cheaper rate. So you've taken a loan from this bank. And please, let's talk about that. When you take a loan, make sure they're not taking a loan to spend on um, ephemeral things that doesn't give back value. Now, when you take taking a loan somewhere and um, the rates have dropped or you now find in another bank that is giving a cheaper rate, don't be afraid to ask for that bank to buy the loan. They can buy it. They will buy it and then give you a cheaper rate. That will reduce your interest expense. So think about that. I'm sure you can, you can um, find out more information. Um, as HR, I'm sure you have those relationships you can also leverage. Oh, learn to do analysis of your numbers or learn to analyze your numbers. Learn to analyze your numbers. How much are you earning? How much are you spending? Look back on your previous months and make a sense of your financials, right? I mean, at some point, a friend of mine, I saw that she, she was offering a service of helping professionals to um, analyze their bank accounts, to know what they spent in the previous year and all of that. Once in a while, you can explore that. If you, can't, if you don't have money to do it, you can do it for yourself. Sometimes just download your bank account and look into what you're spending money on. What are you spending money on? When you look at it, it will give you some sense. That, what was I thinking when I bought this? So what, what, what did I use this money for? So when you're spending, again, when you're making transfers, for example, you should have clear description of what you're spending money on. So I can make sense of it thereafter. If you just transfer without a description or narrative or narration, you might not know what you're spending on. So it's important you have that so that you'll be able to take a learning from your numbers. I mean, I'm talking about previous numbers, right? Leverage. Leverage is one of my biggest words. It's one of those words I love, right? Leverage. You can leverage things, leverage assets. Or for example, when you take a loan, for example, you can rather than put that loan directly in what you wanted to invest it in, you can look at another asset that you can invest it in. It will give you a return. And then that return is what you are then investing into what you wanted to invest in originally. You see, so you don't have like two layers. You know, we spoke about reinvestment, right? Leveraging is one of those ways that you can plan a smart reinvestment. Uh, this this thing is a bit deep, but I will try and break it down. So an example, an example, you take a loan from this bank. They give you that loan at, say, 19%, right? Now, you want to invest that loan in land, right? You found the land. Instead of investing the old money in that land, right, you can invest a portion of that money in the land, but that portion, you don't just take it out of the fundament or the foundation. That money that you are taking, you can go and fix it somewhere where you get some returns, right? There are some of those assets that when you invest in it, immediately they give you your promised return and put your money in for when it's due. When you get those kind of um, investment instrument, you can, whatever comes out of that initial investment, you then use it to go and buy the land you want to buy. So the land is appreciating. The investment you have made has given you an immediate return, for example, and 
you're fine, you're home and dry. Yes, you're paying the interest, but the interest you're paying would then reduce, the weight of the interest will reduce. Now, someone says that, why do I need to take a loan and um, be paying interest rather than staying debt free? And I'm okay, I am not owe anybody. When you look at the asset you're putting the money into for the period of time that your bank would deduct your salary for the loan repayment, by the time you are done, the asset you have put your money into would have appreciated. The interest you have paid, you would have even almost forgotten the pain of the interest. You have to take a trade-off, right? Most times, the interest will not be equal to the return that you will gain in the asset that you have invested in. And the bottom line is, if you didn't do it at all, you would have still spent that money that you are earning and you would land in a place of no, no appreciation or no, appreci no appreciation in your um, assets. So it is better that you share that um, return that you're going to earn with the bank. The bank takes a portion of interest and then you already didn't have an asset. I hope you get it. And some of those things require maybe some practical analysis, okay? I haven't said all of this. I, I want to say that in conclusion, that financial literacy is not a sprint, right? It's a continuous journey. You need to keep improving your knowledge. You need to keep practicing your learning so that you can get closer to your desired destination. All right, it's been an interesting topic and we've been on that for about 40 minutes or 41 minutes. I'm sure it's going to be a good time for us to ask questions. Now, there are a couple of um, bonus tips on the, the, share, the, the slides that I'm going to share. I'm sure um, Yemi will share with the people in the community. And for those of you that are not in the community, I'm sure you would get a link to join when Yemi comes up to take questions. All right, so this is a thank you from me. And I'm sure we'll go back to the question mode. All right. Over to you, um, Yemi. Thank you so much. That was fantastic, educative, enlightening. Thank you so much for what you have done tonight. We'd like to take a few questions, if any. And I would like to get people the fastest fingers. Also, if you have one or two contributions quickly along this subject matter, nobody knows everything and all of us have something to contribute. Okay, we are pressed for time. Any questions quickly, please, or any contributions? I'm also checking the chat box. Oh, so I see a lot of accolades, appreciation, commendation, gratitude. Fantastic. We have two more minutes to find out if there are any questions or contributions. We are excited to close it. All right. Okay. Maybe I should ask a question. Who would like to give me money here? I need some cash. I'm not joking. You can ask me for my account number offline. I'll be glad to. In case you are looking for somebody to invest in or someone to appreciate on the lighter note. Okay, so Stella says here, yeah. okay, good. Hola, today. Hola, today. You can ask your question. Meanwhile, while we are, while we are waiting for Hola, today, Stella says, Did you say you are not a financial expert? Thank you, Faith, for this insightful share. Hola, today you have the floor. All right, thank you very much. Um, my name is Damola Olatsu, and thank you very much for this uh, insight. Really, um, I enjoyed the session. I joined quite deeply in this date, but where I joined, I I really um, gained some things from it. So my question will be: um, for you mentioned something about loan negotiation. I didn't get that part so That was where I joined. So I wanted to know how it works, right? Because um, I think I've heard something like that before. But where I heard it also, the person was not able to do justice to it well. 
So if you can just give me like a, a little bit of uh, share the video you would like to me to do, and I can make my chat for that. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> so on loan renegotiation, you need to have facts. I give you an example. Sometimes ago, I took a loan and the loan was given to me at um, 21 or 22 percent. And I sat down, I looked at the, the contract of the loan. There's usually this contract to share with you the terms of the agreement. I, I mean, you've got to spend time to read the fine lines or the fine print. I took that um, document, read it, and then two things I negotiated from there was the interest rate and then the management fee. I had asked questions. Of course, I, had, I, I have a, an account officer, and everybody has an account officer, irrespective of your, um, um, what's it called, your account size or your cash flow, whatever. Everyone has an account officer, but you've got to be in a relationship with that, your account officer. Look into the numbers. So I did look into the numbers, and I saw opportunities where they could um, make changes for me. So I called my account officer and pointed out these areas and said, see, I can't take this and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to drop this loan if you guys cannot help me push back. I mean, banks also, they have levels of authorities. I pushed and said, okay, this is what I want. This is what I want. And this is why I want it, right? I saw that they could actually change those. Then I also asked this person to, to of course, give me some insight as an account officer. I know they would be loyal to the bank, but at the same time, there, there's a way that you would be able to negotiate and have those conversations with them. So I had a conversation and then she asked me to write an email. I wrote an email. I didn't limit it to the conversation we had. I detailed everything I was proposing into that email and requested for a review. I didn't get everything I wanted, but they reduced my rate. They reduced my rate. So. What my principle is, do not be afraid to ask. The worst you will get is a no, but you can ask. That's one way. Another way to renegotiate is, I mean, be, be informed of what's happening in the market. When, um, when the NPR drops, when the NPR increases, you get to know. When NPR drops, it gives you an opportunity for your investment, I mean, your interest rates to drop. If your contract said that, I mean, the terms of the loan, right, says that the figure is not fixed. That's also important when you're reading your loan terms. If you can adjust, if you can push back on that contract, then you should push back when NPR and NPR drops. Now, if you can't, if the bank is not ready to do that, then you can scout for banks that can give you a, a loan at a cheaper rate. There are banks that would usually give loans at cheaper. So you can reach out to them, enter I mean, to the banking hall, ask questions, or speak to your account officer, or speak to people in your uh, your department. You're an HR person, right? So as HR person, I'm sure you have um, access to your finance team, right? You can ask them. That your company has most likely more than one bank. Ask those banks what rates they are giving. If you have a cheaper rate, then you can move to those um, banks. So there's like three ways I think you can renegotiate your um, rates. I hope that answers it. Oh, beautiful. Excellent. We'll yes, take yes. Thank you very much. The final comment question from Uncle K. And then there is a question on the chat box. But if you like to respond, I will suggest you respond as a chat. Blessing is saying, do you mind sharing some credible companies that offer good investment packages? If you want to respond, if you want to. Yeah, so <laughs> as it was. yeah, so we can connect, we can connect in the chat and I could um I could share. But I've said the caveat is I do not represent any company. I do not mm -hmm. I'm not on a financial expert. Whatever decisions you make is your decision. You have to own your decisions. All right. But I could share privately. It said. Even though when faith speaks, you should ask. Uncle K, final. Mr. Oli, I'm just good evening, sir. I'm, I'm, I'm loyal, Lord. I'm, I'm much loyal. If I'm loyalist. <laughs> good evening, everyone. And thanks for this wonderful and insightful presentation. It's most needed at this time of the economic condition. Trust me. It's just the right thing that we need to have. Everyone needs to be financially literate. 
But I'm wondering if I, I mean, looking at all this, something really caught my attention when you were talking about your personal finances and how you, you know, discipline yourself to keep 20% behind when you have anything. And I'm looking at the present condition of this country where everything, prices have gone up, um, cost of fuel, cost of housing, cost of education, house rent and the rest. And then your salary is not increasing at the same rate. And at the end of the month, by the time you factor in your transport fare and um, your feeding allowance, hardly would you even have house rent to keep. And then a lot of us end up borrowing before the month even ends. And then some even go as much as this online app borrowing and the rest. In other words, what I'm saying is that our take home can hardly take us home. So at what point will it be possible for anyone to be able to save 20%? And if you cannot save 20% and you are living from, you know, as you collect it, you are eating it, you are collecting it, you are eating it, just living one day after the other. I mean, is something wrong with that? That's my question. Thank you. And I love that question because it's very relevant and critical, I mean, for all of us. And I'm not exempt. With this first subsidy, all the changes that has happened, uh, my financial life has become very interesting, exciting. Recently, like I told you, I sat my kids down to start having this conversation. One of the things that led there was not only to educate them. That was part of the grant plan. I mean, I get to equip them on a regular basis. But the pressure we are all under right now is one of those things that drove me to that point. And I'm asking myself questions because the money is not enough. That's the truth. Like I told you, no matter how much we're earning, it's hardly enough. Now, this time is more precarious. It's more critical. The money is not enough. So I am thinking already about what else can I do to bring additional cash flow, including creating intellectual products that you can sell. You're HR professionals. You've got knowledge. There's the knowledge market, a huge knowledge market you can leverage. As you see me here, I've sold eggs before. I've sold granuts before, and I'm never shy to say it. I've sold jewelry before. I go to Lagos Island, buy jewelry, and sell. I've gone to Kano, for instance, to buy gold to sell. So you, you, we, we cannot be wearing suits and sweating under the suits, <laughs> knowing that uh, when the suit fades, I can't even replace it. We can't be doing fine girls and fine boys without getting our hands dirty in terms of doing the hardcore work. The salaries are not enough. We have to find other alternatives, other ways to make money. Yeah, of course, uh, um, legible ways or um, um, professional ways to, to, to make money. So it doesn't have to be your nine to five. We cannot stick with nine to five. And some people say, oh, the time is not even enough. So where do I get the time? My brother, my sister, you've got to stretch. We have to look for, I mean, the, the times demand this, desperate times this require desperate measures. Of course, desperate godly measures. But we've got to stretch. We've got to look for the extra time to put something in there. I, we cannot stick, okay, we, we cannot be restricted to just the funds we're making. And like I said, the moment you have that principle, you will be pushed to think of what else can I do? to earn an extra and that extra an extra 1k extra 5k extra 100k is not too small to start with i hope that answers thank you so, so much for this insightful session i'd like to appreciate everyone one thing i can pick out from our last response is that you may also need to work with your stakeholders and by stakeholders here could be your spouse, if you are married, your parents, if they are heavily dependent on you, your friends. So maybe you are clubbing every Friday before. For now, you want to suspend it to twice a week or once a month. I know people, you won't believe it, they do their shopping at the Okrika markets at Yaba. And when you see them, they wear designer. It's just that it is original, but it is Okrika. So some people look good, at relatively cheap rates. You don't have to do that. Our values are different. But look deep, what can you do without? Some people, I won't mention, on certain TV packages don't need to be there. I tell some people, 
I know you like football. Must you be on the premium? Why can't you watch the the blitz and see all the highlights in, in 15 minutes? Make sure you are getting full value for your money. That is it. It's very, very important. Whatever cut you can make, look at it. Some things that cost some of us money, you won't believe. Some people will still live their life. By now, everybody should be using what you call this kind of energy saving light. Nobody should be using yellow, you know, inverter. Tech. Think about it. It may be cheaper than, than fuel. If you don't have inverter by now and you have a generator, I don't understand. Now, if you don't have inverter, you don't have generator, I understand. But if you are using generator, you are spending a lot of money. Just think about it. Okay. We would like to end it here. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, Fritz, I can tell you. When you mentioned you sell eggs, I remember that correct. Babu said it's about that. Ask. Thank you so much. Ma. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Thank you. Let's say thank you to our facilitator. I will unmute everybody now. Please, this one won't cost you money. Don't say thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank 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 you. Thank